Welcome to worship at San Marino Community Church. This is our contemporary worship. I'm Reverend Jeff O'Grady, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here to our worship service, especially if you're visiting with us for the very first time. We're glad that you've chosen to join us and join with us in worship. Uh, special uh, recognition this Sunday, if you're worshiping with us on Sunday morning, we do have a communion at the conclusion of this service, and we'd love to have you join us. So if you haven't yet prepared your elements, grab whatever you can from your kitchen, whatever's in the cupboard, bread, juice, water, whatever you've got, and join us at the conclusion of the service for communion. If you're worshiping with us on Sunday morning, there's a chat feature uh, that you can participate in. Willow Stevens is in the chat room. She'd love to welcome you. So reach out, say that you're here, identify who you are, and participate in the conversation that's taking place in the chat room today. Um, if you're worshiping with us at any other time than Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we'd love to have you look at this QR code that's coming up on the screen and point your device at that QR code. Let us know that you're here. The, this information is not something that will put you on a list or send a lot of materials to you. We just want to connect with you. And this is a wonderful way for you to connect with us. It gives us a chance to pray for you and with you and let us know what your needs are so that we know that you're worshiping with us. That QR code will remain on the screen even after the QR code uh, leaves so that you can use your device at any time that's convenient for you during these announcements. Um, we certainly want to thank all of you who've been so generous to San Marino Community Church through this past year. It's taken quite a lot to adapt to all of the changes that have taken place because of the pandemic. So we're grateful for every gift. There are three ways that you can give to the church. You can contribute by sending us your donations in a check or dropping them by the church office. Or you can use our Venmo account. Or you can go to the church website and just click on the Give button and give through a charge card, a credit card that way. We're grateful for every gift that we receive. And now, friends, remember, anyone who is in Christ has become a new creation. The past is finished and gone. Everything has become fresh and new. Come, let us worship the Lord together. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a relatively new song here. We sang this during the Ash Wednesday service, if you had a chance to worship with us on that day. Um, but this song is called Funeral for My Past, and it's by an artist named Liz Longley. And uh, I think it's so poignant for this series that we're in right now, Letting Go, Letting God. Um, it's about letting go of of the pain and the baggage and the bitterness and the anger and the shame that we carry around with us that do us no good. Um, and not only that, I love that this is a funeral for my past. So a funeral is a public thing. We are not meant to deal with all the stuff we carry around on our own. But our shame, which is what we're talking about this morning, is so often isolates us and pushes us even farther away from one another. But we weren't created for that. We were created for community. So I just invite you... Um, as we sing this song, you can listen to the words, let them wash over you. You can sing along. There's, there's a particular part of the song that goes like this. Uh -huh. And when I do that at home, I want you to sing this. Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Uh -huh. And then you sing, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. And I know you can't answer me back, but... I hope that you will sing that along with us as we as we go here. And those of you in the room, you can sing it too, because now you know how it goes. All right, here we go. This is Funeral for My Past.
Let it go, let it be, let it rest here in peace. Lay it down at the funeral for your birthday. Oh. God, may we have the courage to lay it down. It says in Psalm 32, when we kept silent, our bones wasted away all day long. But then we confessed our sins to you and we brought the things that are holding us back and limiting us to you and let the light shine on them. God, I'm now obviously paraphrasing scripture that it ended a minute ago. I don't want to say make it seem like I'm quoting that. But um, God, we just ask that we would have the courage to bring whatever it is that we've been hanging on into the light where you can restore it, where you can heal us and make us whole. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It is now time for our children to join us in the Spiritual Formation Zoom Room. You can join Miss Natalie at this time at 1015 with... Uh, the Zoom room, and we encourage all of our children to participate in that wonderful experience. The sermon series that we're in today is a continuation of Letting Go, Letting God. It continues with an emphasis today on the, the concepts of shame and guilt. Two weeks ago, we started this entire series focused on the future as we shared about the concept of worry and how we approach the future. Last week, we focused on the past and what we do with the grudges that we hold and our need for forgiveness and to forgive others. This week, we're also focused on the past once again, but in a way that connects with the future in an important way, the implications of our past. How can we deal with shame and guilt Letting go of guilt and shame and giving up the hope of a better past. It was a difficult assignment this week, frankly. I had to spend a good deal of time reading in psychology about shame and guilt. This is a sermon my good friend and, for, and member of the church, Dr. Jeff Prater, might have given even more effectively. Our text of Scripture comes to us from Isaiah, the 54th chapter. And in this text... The prophet is recounting the experience of the nation of Israel. And that experience has been one of loss, like a woman who's been left by her husband and who's barren. Listen for God's word as I read from the 54th chapter of Isaiah. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged, for you will not suffer disgrace. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the disgrace of your widowhood you will remember no more. For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, like the wife of a man's youth when she's cast off says your God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious and almighty God, we have come to hear a word from you. We ask that you would quiet within us any voice but your own and speak to us now as only a living God can. For we pray in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lament is turned into rejoicing in this text. And the, this particular scripture captures beautifully what's also captured 
in Psalm 30, where it reads, Sing praises to the Lord, O you his faithful ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. A number of years ago, Robert Fulgham, a Methodist minister, wrote a little book entitled, All I Really Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. He writes, Most of what I really needed to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sandbox at nursery school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Everything you need to know is in there somewhere. He writes, The golden rule and love and basic sanitation. Ecology and politics and sane living. Think what a better world it would be if we all had cookies and milk about 3 o'clock every afternoon, and then we lay down with our blankets for a nap. Or if we had a basic policy in our nation and in other nations to always put things back where we found them and clean up our own messes. And it's still true, no matter how old you are, he writes, when you go out into the world, it's best to hold hands and stick together. We all learned a great deal when we were children about the moral universe in which we operate and how we should behave. Learning to get along with others and how to succeed in life. But we may have also learned some viewpoints of ourselves that are less than constructive. For example, once in first grade, I returned to class after having been ill at home for several days. And when I finally was able to return, and I found myself seated in a reading circle in my classroom. We went around the circle, and each student was asked to read the next portion in the story itself. And when it came to my turn, I just couldn't remember a particular word in the story. I, didn't, I couldn't remember how to pronounce it. And I sat there for the longest time, struggling to figure out how to sound out the word. And as I was struggling, my classmates began to snicker and laugh. And then I noticed even the teacher was beginning to laugh. I felt ashamed and humiliated. I think it's probably the first experience of feeling that sense of shame that I'd ever experienced as a child. The feelings of being somehow dumb and inadequate left me wanting simply to run out of that class and run home. And that experience was so profound as it is for young children that it really led me to not want to read at all. I mean, it has that kind of profound impact. What kid wants to do something they don't feel very good at? So for me, I turned to recess. That's where I could excel. I wasn't afraid of abandonment out on the, on the playground. Others I know have the opposite experience. They were so afraid out on the playground that they would never be picked when teams were chosen. I never worried about that. But in the classroom, I felt uncomfortable. So there are those who excel in one setting and those who excel in another. And the problem is that those experiences when we're young, particularly of shame and guilt, leave this indelible self-image on us as children. And a child can begin to develop a shamed-based personality. It's the difference between thinking I did something wrong, like cheating or stealing or something like that, 
and the feeling that I am something wrong, deserving of contempt and disgust. Shame is connected with a person's appearance, either in someone else's eyes or in their own eyes. I may be ashamed of my body. I'm too fat or I'm too thin or I'm too short or I'm too large. This is the kind of thing that's imprinted in the scriptures in the very first chapters of Genesis where Adam and Eve disobey God's commandments. And it's in that disobedience that they recognize they were naked. That wasn't a problem before. So they hid themselves. Guilt, guilt itself goes with doing something bad. Shame with appearing as something bad in the eyes of others or even in our own eyes. Maybe you can remember one of the earliest experiences you've ever had of feeling ashamed. I don't really remember anyone ever saying to me, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. And it isn't because I didn't do some things that I should be ashamed of. I mean, there was an objective truth to that. But I just apparently didn't care enough of anybody's opinion who might have said that to me because I don't remember it. But all my father had to do was look at me with a disappointed face and I would feel shame. He mattered to me and I saw myself through his eyes. I'm grateful that my parents didn't use shame as a way to control our behavior, although I suspect that uh, they were capable of that sort of thing. But I grew up in a home that was not shame-based, and I'm grateful. One can feel guilty if one has or one feels one has done something wrong, but one can feel ashamed of being all sorts of things, of being disabled or being stupid or being ignorant or in some way defective. We can feel guilty about being cowardly or ungenerous in our lives. We can feel ashamed of engaging in certain sexual experiences or eating even certain foods or breaking certain tabo taboos, even though they don't actually harm anybody in particular. We can feel ashamed if we cannot keep up the march or, or pull our own weight in some problem solving. Shame and guilt are not the same thing. Guilt's a little more objective. Shame is more subjective. Either you are or you're not guilty of an infraction of some kind. Guilt's a transgression of boundaries, while shame is a moral failure to live up to our ideals. We fear punishment when we're guilty. We fear abandonment when we're ashamed. We're afraid we've shown ourselves finally utterly to be unlovable. Guilt has everything to do with wrongdoing. Shame has everything to do with wrong being. The intended result of both guilt and shame is really the health and well-being of everyone. Both guilt and shame literally can be constructive. They guide us towards the right relationships and the right way of being in relationships. So in the right place and used the right way, they lead us back on track, avoiding destructive behavior, either self-destructive or destructive for others. Guilt helps us avoid punishment. Shame leads us to our highest ideals. But the values have to somehow become internalized 
in order for us to feel any sense of shame if we don't live up to those values. Every parent knows the challenge of really helping children internalize values. You know, I've heard lately that some have suggested we live in a shame-based culture. And I've seen examples of that on college campuses. If you don't support the latest progressive cause and support it in the way that the group thinks is absolutely the best, well, then you become shunned or you become ignored or you become attacked on social media. You become shamed. Certain speakers are protested because they take positions unpopular with students. Students turn their back on the speakers with whom they disagree in order to shame them. And the pressure to conform to all this can be really quite intense. It is fear that you'll be poorly perceived by others, in the eyes of others. And it leads to kind of a litmus test of loyalty. And that's true on the progressive side and on the conservative side. Shame is used to control behavior. It's not the issues ultimately that get discussed. Identity gets attacked. Different cultures have many different ways of approaching this, but there's a universality to shame and guilt. Some cultures are known as more shame-based. Think of the Japanese samurai who can never possibly surrender. It doesn't matter what's right or wrong in any situation. To lose face with themselves and those who are important to them is intolerable. They would rather die. So shame can be constructive, leads us to change into right relationships with others and with God. But it also can lead us to a shame-based personality where we withdraw from others because we're afraid of being abandoned by them. We become self-protective and we isolate ourselves because we don't want them to perceive just how defective we really are. That's where the love of God comes in, right there. It has the power to utterly transform our own self-understanding and our own misguided self-perceptions. Once you encounter what is sometimes called the aggressive love of Jesus, or as Brennan Manning describes it, the relentless tenderness of Jesus, that God has this unconditional love, this unconditional desire to be in relationship with you. And in so doing, he restores your capacity to be in relationship with others. That, that becomes absolutely transformative. No longer are we fundamentally worried about abandonment and living with a self-image ashamed of who we are. Now, all of that gets unraveled and undone. It concerns me as I read the press these days, the growing numbers of people who are committing suicide of all ages, particularly difficult for 18 to 24-year-olds. They believe somehow they're flawed fundamentally and unworthy of living. And it takes real love to overcome that self-perception. Constantly comparing themselves to others. Others who are more beautiful or smarter or with better opportunities or a lot more personality. We simply can't abandon our self-images until the scaffolding is there 
for some other understanding of who we are. Or take the opposite side of that. Conversely, there are young people who are narcissistic. Their self-image is completely held together by unrealistic claims of greatness. A false sense of self in order to avoid shame. A false self-image. And it cannot be abandoned until there's real love experienced somehow. Only when the real is present can a false safety of an artificial architecture becomes unnecessary. What God has done in Jesus Christ is to take shame and guilt upon himself and nail it to the cross. Crucifixion, deliberately developed by the Roman government in order to maximize physical pain and the emotional anguish of shame for everyone to see. Jesus endured the shame of that naked exposure on the cross at the crossroads of the Roman Empire. And he endured the fear that undergirds all shame, the fear of abandonment. And Jesus' cry of dereliction from Psalm 22 My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It absorbs all the shame of all time. You think you feel shame? You think you're afraid of abandonment? Do you think that the world would be a better place without you? Jesus knows that pain and the loneliness that comes with it, that shame in the very depths and to the depths that we can't even imagine. He's gone to the depths of despair that you and I might have life and life abundant. He's loved us unconditionally in such a way that all that superficial architecture by which we built our lives and our self-images around, our shame-based self-images, our narcissism, our unrealistic sense of worthiness, all of that can come down. Letting go, letting God It's a lot more than just a catchy phrase for a sermon series. When it comes to shame and guilt, it's not only simply a matter of more will, more willpower, or clearer convictions. Our problem is so much more significant than that. Human life, our lives, are not what they should be, not what they've been created to be, We miss the mark. We fall short. We fall short of the glory God intended. We don't live in harmony with others as God designed. We need help. And rather than trying to convince ourselves that we're invincible or capable of pulling ourselves out of the mess that we've made of our lives, we have to remember that we find comfort not in our own capabilities, but in this relentless tenderness of Jesus. Jesus has reconciled us to God, to one another, and even to ourselves. Recently on Ash Wednesday, we were marked with the cross on our foreheads in ash as a sign that God has reached all the way down to the dust that we are to make us new. 
reconciled from our guilt and shame by the power of that cross that's been etched into our foreheads. It's a sign that our life now is a hidden one, restored and redeemed by the power of God's amazing love. It's the only thing I know that has the power to lift our guilt and absorb our shame and put us back into life with a future full of promise and opportunity. Don't miss that future. Christ said to his disciples, I'm telling you this now so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is the reason Christ has come. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. And so Jesus invites us to this table. This is the Lord's table. It's a life-giving place. It has all that we need to sustain us. This is the Lord's table and all those who humbly put their trust in Christ and who are sorry for their sins and desire to be delivered from the burden of shame and guilt, who long for that life and life abundant that Christ came to bring, all are encouraged and invited to come to this table. Let us so come that we might receive all that nourishes human life and allows us to thrive. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They'll come from east and west and north and south to sit at table in the kingdom of God. When Jesus was with his disciples and after walking the Emmaus Road, he appeared to be going on. They invited him to stay. And the guest became the host. In the breaking of the bread, they recognized him and their eyes were opened. Let us come now to this table and let us have our eyes opened as well. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we do come at your invitation to receive what it is that you have for us. For we feel the burden of our own guilt and shame. We ask that you would lift it as we come here to receive these elements. We take from the earth that you've created your own gifts of bread and wine. We ask that these would be set apart for a special purpose that these would become the body and the blood of Christ, and that we would be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place and time. Receive our thanks, O Lord, for your presence here at this table. Consecrate these elements and use them for the sake of Christ, that as we are nourished, Christ might become as much a part of us as these elements will. For we pray in the name and the sake, for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, on the night in which Jesus was betrayed in that upper room, with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, as we ministering in his name give this bread to you. And he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup. And he poured it out.
saying, this is the cup of salvation for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this cup, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, we gather together as a community to be together just as it once was and it will always be. Take and drink. As we have been welcomed at this table, we know what grace tastes like. And as we have that in us, let us go to God in prayer. Would you pray with me? God of never-ending grace, who not only meets us where we are, but does not leave us where we are found. Meet us in palpable ways like this bread and this cup, like the sound of music on deaf ears, sight and sunset to blind my eyes, like the scent of fresh baked bread will recall every detail of a memory or like a newborn is carried. Especially this week, God, our core anniversary, the anniversary of things shutting down, it's more of a lament than a celebration. Though we can find things to celebrate, we are grateful for more vaccinations distributed, numbers of hospitalizations down, the warmer weather of spring, kindness posted across our social media feeds to the more devastated parts of our country. The communities and people have not closed their hearts to those who are suffering. And we see schools have opened and have found a routine that has given them an option for in-person learning. God, we are a people who long for your presence among us, for palpable reminders that you are here. You heal bodies and hearts, you heal relationships, and you heal past wrongs. Though through you, we are made whole. Through you, we have strength. Through you, we draw near to one another and share how we have been transformed. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in all oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun.
We have an opportunity to do some things together as a community. And so we invite you to a couple of these things coming up. If you are a friend of us, you are a friend of Friends Indeed. It's an organization in Pasadena who has always had a heart for those experiencing homelessness. And now they are collecting items for their bad weather shelter. Yes, in Southern California, we do have bad weather just being out in the elements of something that people need help with. And so there is a list on our website of things that they are in need of, and we would love to have you uh, dig into your own closet and go to the store and help out with that list. Our local, Pasadena, or our local San Marino Police Department has said that they are in need of more love kits. These are kits that we have been putting together for years here, that if we have one of those, that are filled with socks and a bottle of water, maybe a couple of snacks and maybe some hygiene items. This thing can be handed to somebody who is in need and it completely changes the conversation from move from this place to how can I help you? And we're so grateful to be able to partner with them on that. One of my favorite Sundays is coming up and it's going to be the Sunday after Easter. It is Confirmation Sunday when some of our youth from our church who have taken this entire year, albeit on Zoom, have been able to learn about some of the truths of this church, the church, and who they are as Christians. And so we will be able to present them as new members of this congregation and they'll be helping us lead in worship. So I hope that you will join in with us. That'll be super fun. They are 14 and 15 year olds, and that's about when you came here, so I'm sure you've baptized some of them. I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, and now as we conclude our service, go into this day, go into this week, go into this remaining period of time of Lent, but don't let the past rob you of your future. Redeemed, restored by the relentless tenderness of Jesus Christ. Go with courage and with faith. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with us all. Amen. All right, we're going to send you out with a song today uh, called Forever Young by Bob Dylan. If you're a Parenthood fan, you might recognize it as the theme song. Uh, the words are so good. This was a special request by our one and only uh, Bong Bringus. So we hope you enjoy. all come true. May you always do for others and let others do for you. May you build a ladder to the stars and clouds.
joyful May your song always be sung And may you stay forever young
Will you lead me? Will you? 